Dave was not included in my research as a source of information. This decision was made after a single conversation with him, during which he simply repeated his father's advice, if you don't need to do anything, don't do anything. If there's nothing to say, don't say anything. Despite such limited communication, I have collected enough strange material to inspire me to write a book. This project will focus on the dynamics of small-town infidelity and the choices that an ordinary person makes when faced with the complexities of the modern judicial system. He decided to take a step forward and fight back in his own way. It is important to note that this is only my point of view since Dave himself is not very talkative. I got most of the information from his wife, who was more than willing to tell me everything in exchange for a couple of thousand dollars to help her cover legal costs. Dave, his wife, and their three children lived in a small, remote town with a population of about 25,000 people, daughter Sarah, who was 15 years old, son Mike, who was 14, and the youngest, Pete, who was 10 years old. Dave is an experienced mechanic, and his wife holds a prominent position in the leading company of their small town. Her boss, a notorious scoundrel, owns the largest car dealership in the city and is rumored to be a contender for mayor when the current one resigns despite the lack of real competition since all the other candidates mysteriously dropped out of the race. The reputation of the scoundrel precedes him. The local city newspaper will closely monitor the upcoming elections. Until recently, I was completely uninterested in the story of Dave and his wife. What can I say? The owner of the newspaper drives a car with the sticker of this dealership on the back window, and I work for a large newspaper located in the state capital. Despite my lack of interest, I couldn't help but get into Dave's struggles, perhaps because of my own experience of bullying at school. But enough rambling, let's dive into the plot. She was lying on the bed, buried in the pillow, seeking solace. Pretending to have the right facial expressions was a difficult task beyond her limited acting abilities. Feeling Donnie's weight on her, she couldn't help but think about how everything had changed. At the dawn of their relationship, there was a genuine buzz in the forbidden nature of their romance. But now, the routine lack of romance and guilt weighed on her, making her yearn for the satisfaction she had once enjoyed. Donnie was a decent lover with all the necessary skills, but it was no longer enough. An hour stolen in a rundown motel didn't suit her. When she was just starting her romance seven months ago, she imagined that the big and dominant Donnie would have great charisma and charm. But to her disappointment, he turned out to be almost the same as her husband, Dave. At first, the excitement caused by the current situation made her feel new and excited. But without the anticipation and romance that women over 30 crave, the physical aspect of the affair had become routine and uninteresting. She was sure that everything would change over time. Donnie was on the fast track to success, and she was determined to be by his side every step of the way. She looked forward to the romantic dinners and passionate nights she craved. Although she didn't love Donnie, she was quite happy that she didn't love her husband, Dave, either. She was sure that in time she would love Donnie as much as he loved her. But there were three obstacles in the way of her perfect plan. The first was guilt. Her conservative Christian parents would never approve of her actions toward Dave and what she planned to do next. And was dreading the upcoming conversation with her husband. Although she had no romantic feelings for him, she admired his dedication and hard work in providing for their family. It upset her that his efforts didn't meet her needs. The thought of the upcoming conversation filled her with anxiety, even though it was still a whole year away. Adding to her disappointment was Donnie's decision to stay married to his cold wife until he became mayor. This meant that their meetings were limited to hasty gatherings in motels and not the intimate evenings that and craved. Returning to the present, and could not shake the feeling that she was trapped, which did not give her emotional satisfaction. When the passion between them began to subside, she was overwhelmed by a wave of guilt. Donnie pulled away and started to get dressed. It was their usual routine. She waited for him to take a shower and left at least an hour after him so they wouldn't be seen together. Donnie finished dressing and kissed her goodbye. Before he opened the door, she whispered to him, Check if anyone we know is around. Donnie obediently looked out the window but quickly stepped back, allowing the curtain to fall into place. Hey Annie, there's a man sitting on the hood of your car. He saw me open the curtain and looked into my eyes. What the hell is this? Donnie asked. She quickly got out of bed and carefully opened the curtain to get a better look at him. 
Oh no, it's Dave, Annie said in a panic. Your husband, he asked. Yes. How did he know you were here? I'm not ready for this conversation yet, Donnie. This could ruin our plans, Annie said, panicking. In what way? What can he do? No lawyer in town will take up his divorce case, Donnie replied cheekily. I'll talk to them later today, but he can go to the press, she suggested. Donnie chuckled. In this city? Unlikely. They're too smart to print anything negative about me. They understand that I will control this city for the next decade or until I decide to enter state politics. Forget about them. It might work in our favor. You've always complained that you don't spend much time with me, Donnie remarked. Now he knows everything, and everything can change, she said. And what will he do? Just look at him. He's much shorter and lighter than me, Donnie chuckled. He can tell your wife, Annie replied. H.M., that makes sense. I don't want this old bag to interfere with our plans before we get ready, Donnie remarked. I'll talk to him, Donnie said and bent down to kiss her. When he walked out the door, she opened the curtains to watch the confrontation. Annie felt a wave of guilt wash over her. Glancing through the curtain, she met her husband's gaze and quickly looked away. After a couple of minutes, she heard Donnie's raised voice and couldn't resist opening the curtain again. She saw a depressing scene. Donnie bent over Dave, who was still sitting on her car. Their eyes met again, and she quickly disappeared into the bathroom. She stood in the shower until the water turned icy but still couldn't get rid of the guilt that weighed on her. When she got dressed and was about to peer out the window again, her thoughts were interrupted by Donnie's call. How long did it take before your husband left after our fight? He asked. I haven't checked since you left, she admitted. Encouraged by Donnie, she peeked out from behind the cracked curtain. Damn, he's still there, she muttered. Donnie, puzzled by the lack of results from his usual bullying tactics, realized that he might have to come up with a new approach. Like many other scoundrels, he relied too much on his one and only method. What did you tell him before that? Annie asked. I just explained to him the realities of life, pointed out the health risks associated with blocking our path, and the futility of his attempts to intervene, Donnie replied. What should I do now? I can't leave while he's still there, she panicked. Don't worry, Annie. Everything will be fine. It's going to get dark soon. Just stay where you are, and I'll ask a couple of my assistants to deal with him, Donnie said. As promised, an hour later, there was a decisive knock on her door. Annie looked out and saw Frank and Rick, two of Donnie's employees, holding Dave between them. When they entered the door, Dave's legs buckled from their enormous size and opened the door for them, quickly averting her eyes to the side as she felt uncomfortable under their gazes. At that moment, she turned around and saw that Rick was holding Dave and Frank was ready to strike. Dave regained his composure and met Anne's gaze with an expression of horror, after which she quickly ran away. Feeling overwhelmed, and decided to take something with her on the way home to feed her family. Arriving home, she decided to dial her husband's phone number. Annie hoped Donnie's people wouldn't do anything wrong to him. Dave's phone sent her to voicemail. Excitement and panic began to creep up on her. After putting the groceries on the table, she did not give up trying to contact her husband. It was only a few hours later that a woman's voice rang out on the other end of the line. It was a nurse who reported that Dave was in serious condition in the hospital. She sat motionless for several hours, ignoring the phone calls. Her parents were supposed to pick up the children. Watching her children get out of the car with their grandparents, Annie felt a knot in her stomach. They entered the room, and her mother spoke first. Annie, why didn't you tell us that Dave was in the hospital? Our number was listed in his contacts, and a nurse called us. Annie stammered, I. I didn't know. There was silence in the room, and all eyes turned to Annie. Finally, her father spoke. Maybe you didn't know, but the lack of urgency or curiosity about his condition suggests that this is not a shock to you. Annie sank into a chair, unable to meet the stares of her family. The weight of guilt bore heavily on her shoulders, and it seemed to her that she was shouting about her guilt to the whole world. With a heavy heart, she retired to her room, and the sounds of her parents cooking dinner for the children reached her ears. Her mother's attempts to persuade her to come out were unsuccessful, 
she just couldn't bring herself to meet their eyes. When silence fell in the house, she plucked up the courage and came out of her hiding place. The children's chatter stopped abruptly when she entered the room. Have you all had dinner yet? She asked, and the words hung in the air. The children were silent, looking at her in confusion and alarm. Her daughter Sarah was the first to speak. Do you know how dad got injured? Shaking her head, she replied, I didn't know he was in the hospital. There was a moment of silence during which everyone except perhaps young Pete realized that Annie was hiding something. This time Pete's crying broke the silence, and Annie's mother hurried to calm him down. What's the matter, honey? She asked. It hurt me to see dad in so much pain. He has broken ribs, a broken nose, and two black eyes, he said. Annie was horrified that she couldn't prevent his injuries. Mike spoke to fill the awkward silence that followed. Why did you hurt dad, mom? What did he do to you? And reacted automatically. He didn't do anything to me, she replied quickly. But as soon as the words left her mouth, she realized she was lying to herself. She couldn't deny that she was the one who hurt Dave. Feeling guilty and ashamed, and sent the children to bed in their grandparents' home. Deciding to drown her grief in alcohol, she passed out on the couch. The next day, Donnie avoided the topic of Dave at work but offered to talk about it later at their usual motel. Confused and torn by contradictions, and reluctantly agreed. As soon as they arrived, tension hung in the air and understood that she would have to admit her actions and face the consequences of hurting the man she loved. Donnie tried to touch her inappropriately, but she gave him a decisive rebuff, and he retreated. When she asked what orders he had given to his two henchmen, he just shrugged his shoulders. Donnie showed neither concern nor compassion when she talked about Dave's injuries. Disappointed, she hurriedly left the room and returned to the office just a few minutes before him. The tension between them was felt for the rest of the day and was noticeable to everyone within 100 yards. In the evening, she did not worry about the fact that her children did not return home before her, their grandparents gave them a ride again. But as soon as they smelled the cooking dinner, they left without saying a word. The children answered her questions briefly. When she entered the room, the conversation stopped. The next day, the atmosphere at work remained tense. Left alone at home in the evening, she sat down at the kitchen table, trying to figure out how to improve her relationship with the children. Lost in thought, she barely noticed how the children returned and began to cook dinner around her. It was only when Sarah noisily placed a plate in front of her that she came out of her thoughts. She sat alone in the kitchen and watched the children eat in front of the TV. The accusing looks were too much for her. She was afraid that Dave would tell them everything. After all, and had never visited him in the hospital, and he was supposed to be discharged tomorrow. Her parents agreed to Dave's return home. After a long day at work, she returned home where chaos reigned. Her mother met her at the threshold with a question about how to feed her children and her husband. Whatever you want, mom, Anne replied. Her mother quickly left, and she saw Pete carrying food upstairs for his hungry father. She reminded him that he couldn't eat upstairs but he insisted that dad was hungry. On the way up the stairs, Pete casually tossed words over his shoulder, unknowingly alerting Dave to Anne's presence in the house. Meanwhile, Sarah and her grandmother were cooking dinner in the kitchen. And stole glances at the stairs, there were only 13 steps between them, but it seemed like a huge chasm. One or two children were upstairs at any moment, and eventually, Sarah brought Dave another helping. When they sat down at the table, Pete asked a seemingly innocent question, asking how Anne felt about their father's silence, but Anne was never able to answer this question. When Sarah started blaming Anne for what happened to her father, she ran away, leaving an unfinished dinner and wandering around the house for several hours. When Anne returned, she found that all the children were asleep. Deciding to get her things out of the bedroom and bathroom, she quietly climbed the stairs and looked through the open door. Dave lay seemingly asleep, his face swollen and held in white strips above his nose. The sight pierced her mind, bypassing everything else, and his uneven breathing almost tore her heart. Quietly gathering the necessary things, and tiptoed into the spare room located directly opposite the master bedroom. After unpacking her things, she decided with a heavy heart to ask forgiveness from the man she once treasured, knowing that she could have saved him from his current suffering. 
returning to her husband's room, and knelt down next to the bed and noticed that he was looking at her with dilated eyes. Frightened, she ran out of the room again. She couldn't sleep that night because she could feel Dave's gaze penetrating the walls and corridors, haunting her every thought. As her relationship with Donnie deepened, she foresaw that a conflict with Dave would definitely happen. She had replayed in her head countless times what she would say to Dave, but when the moment of truth came, it hit her harder than she expected. This prompted him to have a serious conversation with Donnie the next morning, urging him to speed up his plans to divorce his wife. Donnie remained adamant that there would be no divorce or confession of infidelity before the election. He made it clear that if she wanted to end the marriage now, the decision would be hers. Donnie offered her time off and financial support, but she eventually realized she had to handle everything on her own. It was at this point that Anne began to suspect that she was just a casual affair for Donnie. Although she wasn't completely sure about it, she took a break from work to consult with a lawyer and agreed that she would file for divorce from Dave as soon as the necessary documents were prepared. She entrusted all legal issues to a lawyer to speed up the divorce process. She maintained her demands, seeking primary custody of the children with extensive visitation rights for him. In the alimony agreement, she demanded a certain amount from her ex-husband. She also asked to retain the right to live in the house until a later date, which would come after the upcoming elections next year. Dave decided to visit Donnie's dealership. There is a large showroom at the front of the building, and along the back wall, there are four glass-walled offices located one after the other. On the far right is Donnie's office, followed by Ann's office, and then the offices of the administrative manager and the service manager. The layout of the offices is such that there is little space for tables, and the only option is to put them at the opposite end from the door at the end wall. Since Donnie and Ann have doors at opposite ends of the offices, their desks are essentially side by side, separated by a solid wall. An employee of the service center located at the back did not notice how Dave entered the dealership because she was busy working on the keyboard, but Dave came in anyway and walked over to the reception desk, leaning on it and looking straight out Anne's window. One of the secretaries immediately recognized him as the man who coached her high school softball team. She knew he was Anne's husband even though he had never entered the office before. She tried to start a conversation with him, but he just stared blankly at his surroundings. The receptionist couldn't tell if his attention was directed at Anne or Donnie. As she continued to speak, her colleague at the front desk quietly came over and informed Anne of Dave's presence. Anne turned her head in his direction, and it was clear from her look that Dave's gaze was fixed on her. Anne quickly looked away, but she still felt his gaze lingering on her. Ignoring him, she adjusted the shutter so that he could no longer see her. After a moment, she peeked cautiously through the blinds and saw the girls at the reception whispering to each other. Dave did not take his eyes off the window. His neutral expression did not betray the bruises and bandages adorning his face. His intense gaze seemed to penetrate through the blinds, making her worry. She could see the anger building in his eyes. Donnie sighed and picked up the phone, dialing the emergency number. When the police arrived, Dave turned around and left, leaving and relieved but at the same time shocked by this meeting. Donnie returned to the phone. He's already gone. And, are you okay? And took a deep breath. I'm fine, thanks to you. I don't know what I would do without you. Donnie smiled. Anything for you, and Stay safe. With that, and realized that she could always count on Donnie's protection. Dave left the center but had not gone far when the phone rang. Pulling it out of his pocket, Dave saw the name Donnie on the display. Donnie spoke in a low voice, thinking that only the one he was addressing could hear him. Listen, we have a connection with your wife. Get over it. Unfortunately, Donnie underestimated the volume of his own voice, and both secretaries heard his disrespectful remark. Peeking through a crack in the blinds from his office, Donnie saw both women turn their heads in his direction. Donnie confidently walked out of the office and couldn't believe his eyes when he saw Dave on the doorstep of the dealership again. Hearing the commotion in the hall, and opened the blinds again and looked out. The sight before her was terrifying. Frank and Rick held Dave's hands and dragged him to the exit. Dave was being dragged back, and all the while, his gaze was fixed on her. She couldn't help but think that it was her doing. Why couldn't he just let her go? 
and then it dawned on her that all her conversations with Dave were taking place in her own imagination. Until he caught her with Donnie at the motel, he had no idea that their marriage was in danger and was speechless with shock. Although and was devoid of empathy, she genuinely sympathized with Dave as she hurried to the door and left the office. When she came out, Donnie greeted her with a sinister grin. No, Donnie, not that, she begged. Let me take care of it. He replied, gesturing for her to return to the office. Reluctantly, she closed the blinds and sobbed in frustration. Donnie decided to cancel his afternoon appointments and stayed in the office while clients continued to arrive in a continuous stream at the reception. During the day, many small groups formed, which then quickly broke up. She tried not to dwell on this strange phenomenon. At one o'clock in the afternoon, two policemen appeared and struck up a conversation with the administrators. Donnie must have noticed them too. They were shown into his office. The blinds were drawn, and 15 minutes later, they left. The thought of returning home terrified her. Before she left, she asked if it was possible to move into the motel that the company rented on a permanent basis, the one she and Donnie used. Sneaking home before the children returned from school, she quickly packed her suitcase. She wrote a note to Dave and the kids to let them know she wouldn't be home. Later that day, Donnie helped her unpack her room. At 6.30 in the evening, her mother called, and before answering, she thought how typical it was for Dave to use her own family against her. Where are you? Why aren't you at home and taking care of your children? Her mother asked. I'm not coming home today, and replied. He is back in the hospital, and this time you will stay there for at least a week, her mother said bitterly. What? Screamed Ann. I'll be back home as soon as I can, she added, pushing Donnie aside. She hissed, what did you do to him this time? This stubborn fool should understand that he can't provoke me, Donnie replied threateningly. She dressed quickly and hurried home, stopping at a cafe on the way. As soon as she opened the front door, she saw that all three children were crying in the living room, and their parents were trying to comfort them. Her mother led her into the kitchen and asked what happened. How could you leave the children alone while your husband is in the intensive care unit? And saw her mother's nostrils flare with anger. What's going on? Her mother insisted. And brushed her off, saying it was none of her business and that she and Dave were just going through a difficult period. Their eyes met for a moment before her mom spoke. I noticed that you weren't surprised when you found out that Dave was in the hospital. This confirms what the children were talking about. You were involved in the fact that Dave was in intensive care. And quickly began to deny her involvement, claiming that she had no idea that Dave was in the hospital. There was silence again until Anne's mother broke it. Don't you wonder what your lover did to your husband? She asked. And looked at the floor and fell silent. Come on, Anne. Don't you care what happens to your husband? Her mother continued. Since you want to know so much, I'll tell you. This time, doctors believe that his cheekbone is broken and possibly his skull is fractured. They are sure that one of the ribs that was broken last time was pressed into his chest this time, she said rudely. He was stabbed in the chest, puncturing a lung. The ambulance driver informed me that he was found in an alley near your place of work. What did he do to deserve such a brutal attack? Her mother asked. But and couldn't answer through her tears. She paused, then abruptly stood up and rushed upstairs to her bedroom. She let out a heart-rending scream into the pillow. Lost in her pain and confusion, she couldn't tell how long she had been in this state until she was interrupted by a discreet knock on the door. It was her mother, who informed her that they needed to take her father home due to stress. Her father's blood pressure problems had resumed, and he almost fainted when he got up, her mother said. Okay, mom, I'll walk you out, and said, walking her mother to the door. When she came down the stairs, her father was already leaving. He watched her go with a disapproving look but said nothing. Meanwhile, the children went to bed, and she began to think about solving the problem of chaos. The only way out seemed to be moving forward. The next morning, breakfast was held in silence. When she arrived at work, she found out that Donnie would be at home all day. Needing reassurance, she urgently contacted Donnie and asked him to meet her at the motel that evening to discuss the future of their plan. She also wrote to her mother, asking her to look after the children after school and cook dinner, as she had important things to do. 
Her mother agreed, recognizing it as a good idea. Donnie met with her after work and confirmed that their plan was going smoothly. The police did not link any of them to Dave's beating and did not mention her husband's second assault. It was clear that Donnie had taken care of everything. She could have easily prevented this by chasing them as her husband was being carried out the door. Instead, she let Donnie make love to her until 9 o'clock at night, after which she took a shower and went home. When she returned home, it was almost 10 o'clock, and to her surprise, all three children were still awake, eagerly awaiting her arrival. Why aren't you in bed? she asked. Her mother explained that she had allowed them to stay up until and returned, as they were eager to find out about their father. When asked if she went to see him that evening, and replied in the negative. What have you done? How could you not visit your husband in the hospital? Anne's mother screamed. There was disbelief and disappointment in her voice. It looks like you asked me to cover for you while you go to your lover. While Dave is in the hospital, you're having fun, the mother added. I forgot he was in the hospital, and replied absently. The mother quickly grabbed her coat and headed for the door, turning around to deliver the final blow. You disgust me. I'm ashamed to call you my daughter. Don't ever ask me to look after your children again. Only then can you go to your husband and ask him for forgiveness, she said rudely. And didn't have a chance to get to know Dave personally, but judging by the way others described him, he might have been willing to forgive everything if she had abandoned her plans. Unfortunately, she didn't do that. As she later told me, she believed that the pain she caused at that moment would have made rejection meaningless. When Anne's mother called from work the next day, she hoped it would be an apology, but it wasn't. And, how could you be so heartless? Her mother asked. Confused, and asked, What are you talking about, Mom? Her mother replied, Your husband was finally discharged from the intensive care unit, and what did he get? His loving wife didn't even visit him. No, I didn't have time. I was preparing for a divorce. He just received the divorce papers today, and replied with a sigh. Who are you? What have you done to my daughter? Her mother said in disbelief. Immersed in her suffering, she completely forgot that the divorce process had already begun. The lawyer obediently complied with her wishes and handed over the documents to Dave as soon as they were prepared. Acting on instinct, she wanted to deal with the source of her current pain as soon as possible. Mom, can you watch the kids tonight so I can talk to Dave? And asked. No, I can't, Anne. Your father is in the hospital with your husband, the mother replied bitterly. He had a heart attack today, and will have a catheter inserted tomorrow, the mother said. And hurried home to meet the children getting off the school bus, but when the bus arrived at the place, the three familiar faces were no longer there. Calls to their phones went unanswered, leading to anxiety and confusion. Two hours later, a message came asking them to pick them up from the hospital. As they drove home, she scolded them for worrying too much. The children were silent, looking out the car window. I was sitting in my office, thinking about where my next story would come from in an extremely quiet and peaceful time for the world. The news was slow, and then my phone rang. It was Matt Ingram, a former journalism classmate who always paid special attention to local issues in order to have a positive impact on them. From him, I learned about the heartbreaking story of Ann, Dave, and Donnie. He worked at the regional center where our story unfolded for about a year, and here's what happened next. The medical staff at the hospital where Dave was treated were shocked by his wife's behavior, which prompted them to contact Matt. Using his usual skills, Matt quickly contacted several people from the dealership and uncovered the affair between Ann and Donnie, as well as the two cases of Dave being beaten. Although no one directly stated this, the sight of Dave being carried out of the dealership building by two of Donnie's assistants, witnessed by three people, spoke volumes. Despite Matt's attempts to talk to Dave, he remained silent. When he contacted the police and inquired about the progress of the investigation, he was informed that the case had not yet been opened. When he sent the article to the editor, it was quickly rejected because negative stories about Donnie were not allowed to be published in this city. Disappointed, he quit and passed the story on to me. I introduced it to my editor, and to my surprise, the following week Matt received an offer from our newspaper. Two days later, I packed up my things and went to Hicksville for a new assignment. As he told me, the next week was stressful. The children shunned and like a leper, and her social life suffered. 
with no mother around to take care of them, she had to pick them up from the hospital every night. Donnie was always busy at work during the day, so she felt lonely and isolated. The only time they managed to spend together was one night when he managed to sneak into her house after the children fell asleep. It was the first time in a long time that they had managed to spend an entire night together, and she longed for more such moments. On Friday, she received a call from the school and was asked to come for an urgent conversation. When she found out how worried they were about Sarah's sudden weight loss, she was shocked at her own carelessness and not noticing it before. The news that Michael was increasingly aggressive and little Pete was being bullied for his constant tears only made her suffering worse. Unable to cope with all this, she decided to speed up the divorce process in the hope that it would settle everything. On Friday night, she declined an invitation to go on a date with friends because Dave was still in the hospital and Donnie was unavailable. Despite her best efforts, she failed to persuade the children. Disappointed, she decided to leave them at home and go for a walk with friends. She left a note for the children telling them where she would be. Because of the loud music in the bar, it was impossible to hear her phone ringing endlessly. About an hour later, she began answering questions from friends about the rumors that had reached them, denying her involvement in cruelty towards her husband. They eventually moved on to lighter topics until she noticed that two of them were looking at her over their shoulders. Turning around, she was surprised to see Dave standing with a small black eye. Her husband was sitting at the next table, his face partially hidden by a bandage. He hunched over, protecting his sore ribs, and looked at her with a hint of hatred. She quickly turned away, casually waving him off, but her friends noticed her instant reaction and heard her comment. They also noticed the obvious pain and determination in Dave's silent protest. They couldn't help but wonder how much strength it took for him to be there at that moment. In the last hour, they had formed their own opinion about Anne's honesty. One of them quickly justified himself and went to the bar, and the other two, who knew Dave better than anyone, came up to him to talk. The fourth only looked at him curiously and quickly left. Standing at the bar, she wondered if she should give Dave a ride, but her conscience did not allow her to speak to him yet. Even knowing it was the right thing to do, she couldn't bring herself to do it. Just two weeks ago, she had confessed her love to Dave in order to deflect suspicion from herself, but now he knew that it was all a lie. Realizing this, he drove away, leaving her standing there in remorse. When Anne returned home, she saw her mother, who was looking after the children. They hadn't seen each other for a week, and she suddenly realized that she hadn't even asked about her father's well-being. How selfish had she become? After putting the children to bed, she asked about her father but quickly changed the subject when her mother brought up Dave's sensitive topic. But her mother was persistent and asked if Dave had done anything to justify her divorcing him. And named a few minor grievances, but when she failed to convince her mother that the divorce was justified, she realized that she had to confess. And admitted that she had lost feelings for her husband and was experiencing them for another. It was natural for her to lie to her mother, she chose not to reveal that she had used Donnie's affection as a way to improve her current situation. Her mother could not help but express her disapproval that her daughter had left her marriage and children. And listened awkwardly as her mother expressed her opinion. She strongly denied any involvement in Dave's two attacks. In the end, she didn't ask if her mother had talked to her husband about the situation. Wondering if Dave would ever be able to forgive her for the damage done to their marriage, and couldn't help but think that her plan was still in action. When she asked in the evening if Dave had returned home, she was coldly told that he would be discharged in two days but had called earlier and was interested in her whereabouts. It dawned on her that Dave must have sneaked out of the hospital to visit the bar, and it made her think deeply. In the days that followed, after much thought, and decided to apologize to Dave for her infidelity while admitting that the physical abuse was the result of his own immaturity, and insisted that Dave address the children and explain that she was not responsible for his suffering. She thought Dave would agree to this or perhaps beg her to stay, but any hostile behavior could lead to a decrease in his share of their property in the event of a divorce. Dave had other ideas. The night Dave was discharged from the hospital, Donnie left work early to talk to him. Around six o'clock in the evening, Dave and the children left the room, but Donnie met them. Sarah, Michael, and Pete watched Donnie walk toward them from the other side of the parking lot. The three children instinctively took a step towards Dave, who said something Donnie couldn't hear and then stood in front of them to protect himself. 
Donnie looked at the witnesses, then turned and walked away, got into his car, and drove off. Dave took the children to eat and returned home with them shortly before eight. And heard them enter the house laughing and talking, but she continued to wash the dishes. When she was done, she went out into the living room. The three children fell silent when she entered. There was no sign of Dave. And asked where he was and was told that he had taken painkillers and gone to bed. She realized that she had to separate herself from him and the children. And gave the children an ultimatum, saying that they should start talking to her normally or there would be consequences. When they continued to ignore her, she sent them to bed and called Donnie to comfort her. Exhausted and upset, she decided to go to bed early too. When she went up the stairs, she saw that the light was on in the spare room and noticed a pile of her clothes and toiletries on the bed. It became clear that she needed to make a decision about her future. Determined to put an end to this madness, she headed for the door of the master bedroom. Disappointment overwhelmed her when she found the door locked. She went downstairs and took the spare key from the kitchen. Thoughts of Dave's strange behavior flashed through her head, and she armed herself with a rolling pin for protection. Confusion and anxiety gripped her when she noticed a faint glow coming from the room. Taking a deep breath, she opened the bedroom door. The dim light from the hallway illuminated an amazing sight. Dave was lying on the mattress, pale as a sheet. She froze in place when Michael burst into the room. Her son stepped between her and Dave. He looked at the rolling pin and said sternly, You will never hurt my father again. She wanted to explain that it was a misunderstanding and she would never hurt Dave, but from the look in Mike's eyes, she realized that it was pointless. With tears in her eyes, she retired to her room. Did she sleep well that night? Who knows? The next morning, Dave was still asleep when they prepared to leave. The children took turns having breakfast in the kitchen and decided to go up to Dave's room, but halfway up the stairs, there was another guard in the form of Pete. This sight broke her heart, and she left for the whole day to prepare a speech on how to regain the trust of her children. When she returned home at the usual time, she found Dave and the children talking in the living room and barked at the children to go to the kitchen, and they looked at Dave for confirmation. When Dave started to get up, she ordered him to stay put and sat the three children down at the kitchen table and stared at them from the doorway. As she sat down at the table and prepared to deliver her speech, she looked back and saw her tormentor standing right outside the door. Under the weight of two weeks filled with guilt, self-loathing, disappointment, and lack of sleep, something broke inside her. Dave's neutral expression was the tipping point. Guided by instinct alone, she rushed at him, shattering the remnants of her life with renewed vigor. She grabbed a heavy glass fruit bowl from the center of the table and hurled it at her husband. At the last moment, it slipped out of her hands. In slow motion, she saw the bowl heading towards the door frame. Just before the impact, she looked at Dave's face and could have sworn that his neutral expression turned into a smile, but that was the only move he made. The heavy bowl collided with the frame and split in two. One fragment hit the frame harmlessly, and the second ricocheted at a 30 degrees angle and hit the undamaged part of Dave's face. She watched in shock as bright crimson blood sprayed from her husband's deep cut, causing him to collapse to his knees and then to his side. It seemed that life was rushing forward like a twisted movie. Their children, who had been silent in disbelief, suddenly burst into synchronized screams. Mike was the first to react. He jumped to his feet and stood over his father, protecting him. He quickly grabbed a towel, rolled it up, and hurried over to Dave, who was still bleeding from his face. She watched Mike approach her husband, intending to use the towel to stop the bleeding. Mike tried to defend himself by raising his arms, but and forcefully pushed him back. He stumbled and fell, quickly getting on his knees to press a towel to Dave's face. Sarah, showing amazing strength, pulled her mother away from her father. Realizing that his sister had the situation under control, Mike hurried to the first aid kit, tore open a sterile swab, and carefully applied it to his father's face. Sarah urgently shouted to Peter to call an ambulance. Realizing the seriousness of the situation, he ran to the phone to make a call and hoped that she would be able to limit herself to asking for an ambulance and keep the police at a distance by controlling the phone. When she reached for the phone, she heard Mike's panicked cry, Sarah, take the phone upstairs. 
It suddenly dawned on and that they had misunderstood her intentions and were trying to prevent her from using the phone. Sarah quickly ran past her to the stairs, ready to give chase, but then little Pete intervened. He grabbed and by the shins, trying to stop her, but ended up falling hard. When she couldn't move her legs and was lying there, screaming hysterically. Suddenly, she pushed Pete's hands away, got up, and ran. For the first time in my life, I personally observed such unrestrained fear. One of her hands was covered in blood as she ran to her car. I had just arrived for an interview when I saw this drama unfolding. Without hesitation, I decided to step in and help Dave with the treatment. Soon, the ambulance and the police arrived. While Dave was being taken away for medical treatment, the police began to question him. I quickly arranged with Sarah to call her grandmother to come and take care of them. In the midst of the chaos, I learned about Dave's latest ordeal from the children, who told me how their mother physically beat their father, tried to strangle him, and prevented them from seeking medical help. Given my past experience, I got the feeling that the local police might not prioritize Dave's safety. To provide him with the necessary protection, I contacted the state police. Within three hours, two agents from out of state arrived at the scene. This specialized group of officers travels from one locality to another, realizing that sometimes local police can be influenced by personal biases. A police squad arrived in the city, which chased in for some time but could not catch up. I saw the children telling their stories to the authorities before taking Sarah, Mike, and Pete to their father. It was during this visit that I received the only message from him. After dropping them off at the hospital and not knowing where to go, I went to the hotel. And, on the other hand, tried to find refuge with Donnie. When his wife opened the door, Donnie quickly came up with a story that and was his employee who had run away from her abusive husband. The kind woman kindly opened her house for and to give her shelter for the night. The next day, and was too upset to go to work, but Donnie went to work, leaving the women alone. During lunch, Donnie's wife Pamela was in the kitchen when she heard a scream and a crash. Frightened, she rushed into the living room where she found a mysterious man with a face wrapped in bandages who was standing outside the fence and looking at their house. And fainted at the sight and collapsed to the floor in shock. Pam anxiously waited for Ant to come to her senses so that she could ask her about what had happened. Amid Ant's confused ramblings, Pam managed to make out the word husband. Concerned for her friend's safety, Pam immediately appealed to the authorities to expel Ann's abusive husband from the garden outside the window. She also turned to Donnie for support. Donnie arrived before the police and quickly entered the house to take control of the situation and minimize the damage caused by Dave. Upon arriving at the scene, the police contacted Pam to find out about Dave's whereabouts. In a moment of confusion, and mistakenly confirmed her presence, which led to her unexpected arrest. It became clear that Anne had been taken into custody to avoid questioning her husband, highlighting the tangled web of deception and betrayal that entangled them all. Donnie left to negotiate with Anne's lawyer, determined to keep the situation under control. After receiving a call from Pam about a suspicious person watching their house, he quickly returned home. On the way, he devised a plan. According to it, he had to wait until nightfall to distract Pam. He entertained her throughout the day. Meanwhile, I was at the police station, listening to the latest news about the morning events on the radio and trying to gather information about what charges would be filed. The police did not provide details. Despite all my efforts, I still couldn't find Dave. Spending several hours searching, I went back to the hotel and started typing the article while listening to the police radio channel. That's how I managed to find Dave. As night fell, Donnie apparently called the police to get Dave off his property. I heard the dispatch message and drove quickly to Donnie's house. I arrived just in time to see Dave being watched by the police as he drove away. Knowing Dave's penchant for trouble, I decided to follow him. I watched him carefully as he pulled into his driveway and got out of the car. While I was watching him, two shadows appeared from behind the trees and crept up behind him. One of them raised their hand and hit Dave on the back of the head with an object. Without hesitation, I started the engine and illuminated the scene with my headlights. Quickly grabbing my camera, I took several pictures of the attackers before they disappeared into the street, leaving Dave unconscious on the ground. I immediately dialed for an ambulance and the police, knowing that poor Dave would be taken to the hospital again for the fourth time in two weeks. 
It was a grim scene, but I couldn't help but wonder what led to such a brutal attack on such a defenseless man. I had a feeling that Dave would not last long if such episodes continued. What I saw was not just a beating but something much more serious. I gave a statement to the police of the flying squad and handed over my photos as evidence. Dave stayed in the hospital for another night, undergoing tests for another concussion. The next day, I was in court where the judge charged in with assault causing grievous bodily harm. The police hinted that an attempt on life could be added to the list of charges and was released on bail, which Donnie posted. He picked her up in a car and drove her to a motel. He handed her a wad of money and advised her to get rid of the phone since Dave was most likely following her on it. Donnie also insisted that and stay away from him outside of work, especially if there was a nosy reporter around. And was shocked. Donnie was all she had left of her old life, and she couldn't believe that everything had collapsed because of Dave. When and asked how he could treat her so badly if he loved her, Donnie's face twisted with contempt. In an instant, she realized that she was only a fleeting distraction for him and not someone who was truly dear to him. The realization of this was a heavy blow. Now she was a burden to him, a problem that needed to be eliminated. Donnie's cold words painted a bleak picture of her future if she dared to challenge him, and then he left, leaving her alone with the consequences of his actions. As Donnie hurried about his urgent business, he couldn't get the image of her broken life out of his head. She had lost everything, and neither a bottle of whiskey nor anything else could comfort her. It was a grim reminder of the power he had over her and the destruction he had caused. Without thinking, two days later, she found solace when Donnie was taken into custody. My photos taken on the night of the attack on Dave helped to quickly detain his friends. In a desperate attempt to escape, they did not hesitate to attack Donnie. His once formidable power and influence now worked against him as he was denied bail. When my article was published in the weekly magazine over the weekend, his wife wasted no time in leaving him. Despite this, the dealership continued, but she was left alone with the court. After a difficult conversation with her mother to get her things out of their old house, she found herself in a situation where she never crossed paths with Dave or their children again. When the police, impressed by the article I wrote, asked about Dave's previous attacks, she was truthful and outspoken. As a result, she was charged with two counts, failure to report a crime and complicity in the attack. Meanwhile, Dave was granted temporary custody of their three children and faced the dilemma of whether to file a lawsuit against and for a direct assault on him. The custody service made the decision for him. A fiercely-minded local officer sided with him and began the process of granting her custody rights despite the objections of all three children. Dave, realizing that custody was most beneficial for the children, continued to insist on it to achieve the best result. When the child support worker began to persist, Dave began to sit outside his house and closely monitor what was happening. Although the police eventually intervened and removed him, Dave's actions eventually led to the desired result. Neighbors reported that heated arguments could be heard from the juvenile affairs inspector's house. A man's voice was shouting, let's figure it out. The witch ambushes, cheats on her husband does nothing when he is hospitalized twice, and then tries to kill him in front of the children, and you're still taking her side. An hour later, a government employee was seen carrying suitcases to her car. The tension in the family had reached its limit, but she still couldn't bring herself to end it all. When the district court session took place, the truth came out. Everyone was trying to cover for Donnie, who had hired them all. The participants in the trial pleaded guilty because irrefutable evidence was collected against them. Frank and Rick got three years in prison, and Donnie got four. They were taken out of the pre-trial detention cell by a special staircase, away from prying eyes. It was at this moment that the harsh reality of the situation dawned on them. And felt guilty and wrote a long letter to her children, asking them to forgive her for the pain she had caused their family. The other letter was addressed to Dave. There was no apology in it, but there was a request to take care of their children. Dave became a local celebrity, attracting the attention of unmarried women in the area. Sometimes he went on dates when family responsibilities allowed or when the children insisted. When he became interested in one woman, Sarah and Mike talked to her and said that she was perfect for continuing to date their beloved father. Their relationship was developing, and Sarah was thinking about hinting to her father about the wedding. Meanwhile, 
Donnie ended up in a four-person cell, realizing that his former reputation as a small-town bully had no meaning in a state prison. He began to feel like a heavyweight boxer getting hit after hit in the ring. A few days later, he got into a fight in prison, which turned out to be his last. It seemed like picking a fight with a man twice his weight. 